Are you comfortable still with that, given that it does seem like we're seeing signs of a bottoming when it comes to the, the regulatory crackdown, at least? The proximate news is clearly positive. You know, we have seen Shanghai gradually moving towards, um, you know, an unlocked state. Um, we have seen positive news flow about the regulatory pressures on the tech universe, the internet platforms. Um, so I think, uh, you know, at least in the near term, we will have uh, some outperformance from China, and that would possibly pull up the sentiment as far as entire Asian equity investments are concerned. Um, having said that, in the, in the medium term, I think the big concern that one has about China is the ongoing um, slower consumption. If one looks at retail sales, for example, that has declined precipitously. If one looks at the earnings estimates of consumer staples, consumer discretionaries, healthcare, they have been um, on a secular declining path over almost a year now. And um, that's being aggravated by the high uh, unemployment rate, urban unemployment rate, which was 5.8% in March, 6.1% in April. So when one puts these factors into consideration, um, I think uh, you know some, uh, some more uh, underperformance from the Chinese equities, at least in the near term, could still be on the cards. Where are you then overweight in the meantime across the rest of Asia? Where are you seeing opportunities and compelling valuations and perhaps some opportunity to hide from further volatility? Right. The main themes that we like in Asia are, number one, um, the yield ascent beneficiaries or the developed Asia banks. Number two, the tech universe, which tends to gain from consumption demand in Western, uh, Western Hemisphere and the, uh, the, the decline in the Asian currencies. Many of them are actually currency moderation beneficiaries. And third, the entire energy and material complex because we think that the spike in prices is likely to last for longer. Um, the countries, the markets that we are overweight on are Korea, India, Indonesia and uh, Hong Kong. Um, I think, uh, you know, Korea, uh, we are focusing mostly on financials and, and, and tech. India is more of a, a tricky story as far as the macro is concerned because of the pressure on the currency and the oil importing nature of the market. But the stock choices there are, are abundant, they're plenty. Yeah, tell us a little bit more about India because that seems to be a little bit contrarian from what we're hearing, especially as you mentioned with the macroeconomic sure. challenges. True. India, you know, as far as the macroeconomy is concerned, is a bit tricky. Um, the, the, the rebound from uh, the COVID-driven economic decline last year has been sharp. If one looks at the on-the-ground variables in India, like GST or the goods and services tax collection or the road and rail freight, they are consistently surprising on the upside. But having said that, the pressure on the currency as a consequence of Fed's rapid tightening and India's oil importing nature, which has expanded the trade deficit, those are the two significant concerns at this point. Fortunately, in India, you have a few sectors. In fact, one very large sector, which is actually a beneficiary of currency depreciation, and that's the IT services sector. Mm. And some of the other sectors, like financials, we have had a significant degree of easing, right. significant degree of decline in the non-performing assets. So, you know, so some of these broad, big sectors, they're looking a lot better than they were earlier. Manishi, you also mentioned South Korea, and when we're talking about depreciating currencies, of course, we have seen the pressure on the Korean won, a little bit of strength today against the U.S. dollar, but we're still talking about 2009 levels or so, right? Because they're a big exporting country, do you take that as a net positive, or could there be some other side effects that investors are not watching? Historically, Korea, unlike Japan, has underperformed when the currency depreciated. Um, this time around, there has not been a departure from that trend, and we think that the Asian currencies, including the Korean won, could depreciate some more. We must remember that um, the Fed could actually hike possibly three times more by 50 basis points each till September, and from June, we are going to see QT, quantitative tightening, 
which would be far more severe than the episode of QT than we had seen, that we had seen in 2017 to 19. You know, so the pressure on the emerging market currencies, the pressure on the Asian currencies will continue some more time, possibly throughout summer. Um, but that said, you know, I think, you know, the, within Korea, I think the tech sector is now clearly beginning to revive. We are seeing price increases on the part of the large tech exporters. Um, the banks are uh, continuing to outperform as a consequence of the, the yields moving up. Um, this net interest margin expansion of the banks during yield ascent is, uh, you know, a tried and tested right. hypothesis as far as developed Asia is concerned.